Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jana Juzová. I'm a research fellow at the European Institute for European Policy in Prague. And I would like to welcome you at the first session of the second day of the Prague European Summit. In this discussion, we will be focusing on the EU enlargement, the recent developments, but also the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the approximation of the Western Balkan region to the EU and the prospects for the future EU enlargement. But first, before we dive into the discussion, I would like to give the floor for some welcoming remarks to Her Excellency Tanja Strnisha, the Ambassador of Slovenia to the Czech Republic. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the debate on COVID-19 crisis being an opportunity for a fresh approach to the EU enlargement. I would like to thank the Prague European Summit team for including this important topic in the program. I'm truly pleased that the event has been organized in cooperation with the Slovenian Embassy in Prague. The Western Balkans have always been in the focus of Slovenian foreign policy, and Slovenia continues to firmly support the enlargement process. We believe that a credible EU enlargement policy is needed to assure stability in the region and in the whole of Europe. The Western Balkans will be also one of the, priority of one of the priorities of the Slovenian Presidency of the Council of the EU in the second half of 2020. Of 2021. So I look forward to listening to the distinguished speakers and experts and wish the discussion would contribute to a better understanding of the situation and prospects of the Western Balkans. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ambassador, for the warm welcome. And uh, now I would like to introduce you the speakers, because today we are joined by distinguished experts on the Western Balkan region and the EU enlargement policy. Uh, I would like to introduce you first, uh, Mr. Tonino Pizzula, uh, the member of European Parliament uh, who is very much involved with the Western Balkan countries. Uh, then Mr. Peter Grk from uh, the Slovenian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he's the national coordinator for the Western Balkans and secretary general of the Blood Strategic Forum. And then we have uh, Mrs. Vesela Cerneva, deputy director of the European Council on Foreign Relations and the head of SOFIA office of this institution. Uh, welcome. I'm very happy that you could join us today. And, uh, well, the structure, because we have quite a short time for this whole discussion and there is a lot to cover, we will go straight to the questions. And I would also like to encourage our uh, viewers, our audience, to send us uh, the questions they would like to ask our speakers through the Slido application. Uh, I will get to them during the discussion later on in the last, let's say, 15 minutes. So, uh, let's jump straight into the questions. Actually, uh, this week on Tuesday, there was the General Affairs Council meeting, a video conference, and there were a lot of expectations associated to it, because the ministers were supposed to adopt the negotiating frameworks for Albania and North Macedonia, which would allow these countries to actually start the official negotiations process uh, later on, uh, still under the German uh, European presidency, uh, probably in December. However, uh, Bulgaria, uh, the one country, actually vetoed this positive decision on the adoption of the frameworks. Since we have Mrs. Cerneva here, who is based in Sofia, I would first like to ask you, Mrs. Cerneva, uh, if you could explain us the Bulgarian position, because the veto came on the basis of some uh, issues and disputes, bilateral disputes between North Macedonia and Bulgaria on the issues of history and some sensitive matters. Could you explain us what the motivations were and what's the Bulgarian reasoning and how they imagine the possible solution of the situation? A very good question. Uh, actually, a number of very good questions. Maybe uh, too much uh, um, history is needed to explain uh, some of it, and I think it's too early uh, in the day. Eight o'clock in the morning is not the best time, I think, to dive into Balkan, old Balkan uh, histories. Um, so what I will say is uh, maybe, maybe repeat uh, the three points from the uh, kind of the Bulgarian requirements for the negotiation framework. Um, and then I'll try to comment a bit on them. Um, the... The first one is about the name. Um, the name of uh, 
uh, Republic of North Macedonia, uh, the Bulgarian site uh, uh, says, should be the officially used name and there should be a notification from the Macedonian side that whenever um, North Macedonia is used, it refers, refers to the Republic of North Macedonia. This is because, um, as some of our listeners probably know, um, the territory of uh, uh, what we call Macedonia is split between uh, North Macedonia, Bulgaria and Greece. Secondly, there is a, uh, there is a question about the Macedonian language. Um, this point um, could be, I'm, I'm not going to get to go into the history of this, but uh, what, uh, what the German presidency has, be, has proposed there is to say that the Macedonian language has been uh, uh, codified in 44, which I think is something that both sides can, can accept. Now, the problem is with uh, chapter 35, uh, and the, the requirement from the Bulgarian side to add uh, chapter 35 to the negotiation framework, which would ensure um, the fulfillment of the bilateral friendship agreement. Now, this agreement is actually the basis of what we're talking about. This is an agreement that Bulgarian, at uh, that time Macedonia, signed in 2017, and this was a precursor for the PRESP agreement, and back in the day, uh, it was hailed as uh, a very um, kind of uh, good achievement in the bilateral relations. Unfortunately, uh, this agreement has remained there uh, and has not really been worked on. And I think the blame for that goes to both sides. Uh, now, uh, of course, uh, the, the, the problem uh, with, the, with the chapter 35 uh, is that it's... Uh, it's a, a very complicated uh, tool that should that could further impede the negotiations, and this is something I understand uh, cannot be accepted. Overall, uh, if you want to hear my assessment uh, of all of this, this is um, a very good sign of how much uh, damage symbolic politics can make in the Balkans, uh, and we all here in the region have our historical disputes, our bilateral issues. Um, and actually, up until now, the Bulgarian government, and it's one and the same government, by the way, has uh, tried to portray itself exactly in the opposite light as a kind of a country that is an advocate for the Western Balkans. Uh, this was also its main point during the council presidency in 2018. So right now, uh, unfortunately, uh, this is, I think, the first sign of a, of a process which, uh, in which many other countries may try to take part, uh, namely in infusing their bilateral issues into the enlargement process, a process which is at a very low point anyway. And uh, I'm sure there are other countries in the EU who are actually very happy about the Bulgarian veto, uh, and we have to be very much aware of that as well. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Cherneva. Uh, you mentioned uh, the fact that Bulgaria has actually been quite active in promoting the EU enlargement and some progress in this policy uh, in the European Union in the past. And I, what I read and what I followed the situation, uh, it seems that there is quite some confusion uh, because of this fact and this like contradictory position of Bulgaria. Mr. Pizzola, I would now like to give the floor to you. Could you share with Can us? Can I just add one, yeah, one sure. small thing? Because that would maybe also explain your question. There is a small nationalist party in the Bulgarian government uh, which is threatening to topple the, the, the whole government just four months before the regular elections. That explains quite a lot of this. Okay. Okay. It seems that uh, usually the reasoning for this strict position of Bulgaria uh, are based on the domestic conditions in Bulgaria. But Mr. Pizzola, I wanted to ask like you... Like everywhere. Yes, I wanted to ask you uh, about the atmosphere in Brussels and in the European Parliament. Is there any dismay among other institutions than the Council, like the European Parliament or the European Commission, about this blocking? And uh, do you see any way how to uh, progress on this matter and with this decision during December, during the next council session? 
Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, uh, thank you for uh, inviting uh, me uh, this uh, summit. Um, I ate my breakfast already and uh, drank my coffee and I felt the taste. So it means that I'm guess uh, uh, <laughs> Corona negative in a way. So it's a, for the start of good news. But unfortunately, um, uh, after promising start in early uh, 2020 with a new methodology adopted uh, online uh, Zagreb uh, summit uh, and uh, negotiation uh, frameworks adopted. Now we are approaching um, the end of this year uh, with a, a kind of uh, limbo regarding Western Balkans policy uh, from the Brussels view again. So combination of uh, internal disputes uh, uh, with the long-standing disputes uh, between the country uh, in a way are uh, keeping us uh, uh, again uh, at the standstill. But uh, uh, if you ask me about the uh, stances coming from the European institutions, I would like to repeat once again that uh, European Union um, member uh, states unanimously approved the opening of uh, accession talks between Brussels and Skopje in March uh, this year. Um, and the European uh, Commission position is uh, also very clear. Uh, European Commission believes that the negotiations must uh, begin as soon as possible. But for that to happen, uh, we need the consent of the European uh, Union. If I'm uh, quoting correctly, uh, spokeswoman uh, Anna uh, Pisonero. By the way, Northern Macedonia, which has uh, been a candidate since 2005 and has been waiting for opening of membership negotiations since, I guess, 2009, uh, is considered widely as a state that has met all the conditions for the starting this process. But uh, as Ambassador also uh, described to us, you know that the disputes within the Bulgaria itself which is passing through turbulence in a way, uh, and uh, combined with the long-term uh, disputes between Skopje and Sofia, now are preventing us to finish this year with uh, uh, good uh, and long-awaiting uh, uh, good news uh, for the Skopje. So it's very hard now to see what might happen before the end of the German uh, presidency, but uh, if I decoding correctly what uh, uh, German presidency Angela Merkel uh, have said, I think that German uh, will invest more efforts in convincing both countries and first uh, Bulgaria to lift that kind of embargo. But I'm not over optimistic because I think German presidency um, uh, with the very end of it, its term now are um, uh, need to target another uh, much bigger challenge, its adoption of the multi-annual financial frame. Uh, which is uh, also an object of the blockade, but from another corner of the Europe, meaning, first of all, Warsaw and the Buddhists. So uh, I, I would like to see this uh, result, but I'm not over optimistic. Thank you, Mr. Pizzula. Mr. Greg, I believe from your position, you travel to the region a lot and you meet and communicate frequently with the Western Balkan partners. Um, unfortunately, uh, it seems as both speakers before you uh, indicated that the enlargement policy is uh, hitting a stalemate, it could seem, and uh, it probably won't contribute very well to the EU's credibility in the region again. Uh, also during the COVID-19 crisis in spring, uh, it seemed that the image of the European Union in the region because of the slow reaction, despite the fact that the EU then actually made up very well for, uh, and financially very well, uh, for its slow reaction, it seems that the image was hurt regardless. Uh, what is your impression? How does the EU stand uh, in the region now? And has the image of the EU in Western Balkans changed in any way during 2020? Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this summit. Uh, you talked about the stalemate in the enlargement process, uh, which is happening now. You know, to be frank, I think the stalemate on the enlargement process is happening uh, since uh, the last enlargement took place when Bulgaria and Romania joined the European Union. If we, you know, discuss the relationship between European Union and uh, 
Western Balkans after 2007, what we can see or observe is uh, that uh, we have, let's say, to be kind, a policy of uh, small steps. Small steps which ensured that uh, the region of Western Balkans is more or less stable. But this policy of small steps, which for some countries of the European Union are big steps, uh, but we can talk about this later, uh, this policy of small steps didn't bring about one thing which is crucial, and in 2020 we are still facing with the same problem, and this is it didn't reduce the development gap between the Western Balkans and the countries of the European Union. You know, in the last 10 or 15 years, this development gap between the countries of the region and the countries of the uh, European Union is not getting any smaller. And this is one of the problems uh, that we are facing uh, right now. We can talk about the Western Balkans as being stable, but can we talk about Western Balkans uh, as a region which is progressing quickly in order to, you know, narrow this uh, economic energy infrastructural gap between uh, these countries and the, the countries of European Union? I don't think so. So, in my estimation, what we would need is to move from this policy of small incremental steps towards uh, a more bold, more action oriented policy from the European Union, but also from the political elites from the countries of the Western Balkans. What, what do I mean? Well, let's take, you know, the Berlin process meetings. Let's take the summits, uh, EU Western Balkans, which took place. Uh, these summits are good because they show some kind of willingness from uh, both sides to work together and to achieve common goals. The problem is the time in between, I say, you know, the time in between these summits or uh, Berlin process uh, meetings where not a lot is happening, actually. We agree on projects, we agree on uh, a lot of uh, things that need to be done, they need to be implemented, uh, but, you know, if you look at the conclusions from uh, every uh, summit or Berlin process meeting, you can see that a lot of things which were agreed and are put on paper are not implemented. Now, why this is a reason? Of course, you know, it's always, it al it's always takes two to tango and uh, the fault is on the European Union, but also on the... Uh, countries of the Western Balkans. And how do we garner, you know, how do we come to this political will to kind of jump start the whole implementation process? Because, you know, if you look at the documents, they are great. We say inside all the right things, we agree on all the right projects. If we would just put from the paper to the ground all the projects that are uh, being agreed, you know, Western Balkans would be like uh, like a Disneyland. But uh, this is not the case. And uh, because this is not the case, in 2020, we are st still looking at a huge amount of work, which uh, it will need to be done, and there is no more time. I mean, this waiting game, uh, we can't wait anymore, not just because of the pandemics, but because the geostrategic relations in the world are changing. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, Western Balkans is a region which is at the crossroads of north, south uh, and uh, west, east. And it's a uh, appropriate battleground for the geostrategic uh, interests of uh, various actors who would not necessarily have the same interests uh, as the European Union. We need to show, and I will end with this, we need to show that the Western Balkans and the countries of the Western Balkans are in our geographical and uh, interest sphere of influence. Thank you very much. Thank you.
you, Mr. Greg. Uh, before we move to the next round of questions, uh, I would like to remind our viewers that there is a poll uh, also in Slido application where they can send questions and there's, there's another uh, another part where is a poll and uh, now there is a question whether they are in favor of the next EU enlargement happening uh, until 2025. So please feel free to vote. Now let's move to uh, more questions and I would like to start with Mrs. Cherneva. Uh, and thank you Mr. Greg for uh, what you were talking about and also it will actually help me <laughs> to follow up with the question, the next question I have on Mrs. Cherneva. <clears throat> and it's when you were talking about uh, the shifting geopolitical order or situation and other regional or global players, players coming uh, up to the scene. I wanted to ask you, Mrs. Cherneva, uh, sometimes some experts refer to uh, these uh, other geopolitical power is powers, especially uh, Russia, as spoilers, because they basically uh, use the situations and the vacuum created by the European Union to advance their interests in the region. So, uh, do you think that uh, this uh, stalemate or, or this uh, lack of progress in terms of EU enlargement and the decreasing EU credibility in the region could lead to uh, Russia or China or maybe Turkey actually using the situation uh, in their interest? Of course, clearly. Um, uh, look, this is, uh, there, this is a kind of a popular saying that nature uh takes no vacuum um and i think this is uh, valid also in geopolitics i mean especially in the russian case uh what they do in terms of tactics is they use the openings uh the vacuum that uh, europe uh, leaves in the region uh and they use it quite uh, skillfully uh we can uh, of course not um, oversee the eagerness of some of the Balkan leaders uh, to do that. Um, and here I would quote uh, the president of Serbia, but also uh, Mr. Dodik in Republika Srpska and others. Uh, uh, North Macedonia has actually been uh, safer in that sense. Uh, but uh, for instance, I think yesterday there was a uh, uh, some sort of a declaration from the Russian embassy in, in Skopje, which congratulates uh, uh, North Macedonia on the anniversary of some uh, um, uh, of some uh, uh, scientist from 150 years ago, where which gets us back to you know to to the, this uh, very unhelpful conversation right now which is a very good example of, you know, whenever there is a small opening, you can immediately uh, see uh, others trying to get in. Uh, with China, the case is actually, I think, even uh, more untransparent because uh, we're not only talking about investment, we're talking in a way about threatening the structural existence of uh, some of the candidate countries, the debt issue in Montenegro is a huge problem that uh, we will very soon have to cope with um, uh, as, as one example. And so, and, and by the way, when we talk about jump-starting uh, implementation of Berlin process, China would very much like to do that, right? Uh, they, can, uh, they can easily imagine uh, also uh, some benefit there. Um, so, that said, that does not take the responsibility from, uh, from those who, who are allowing this vacuum to happen. And I think in this case, um, it's the responsibility is both uh, obviously on, on Bulgaria and to a lesser extent on uh, North Macedonia. And I would say uh, if we talk about where the Balkans are now, it has a lot to do also with the with the way the, the enlargement process has been going up to date. And the fact that uh, really the political commitment has uh, become so weak um, that, um, you know, many people in the region don't uh, believe in it anymore. And frankly, I am I, I would be very interested to hear what uh, could move Balkan leaders 
to change uh, the way they they operate uh, also within the European kind of framework. Because for now, what we can see is that they totally take the status quo and, um, you know, but I don't see how we can infuse more impetus without a more political commitment. Thank you, Mrs. Cherneva. Uh, Mr. Pizzula, I wanted to ask you um, about the uh, economic and investment plan, which introduced the European Commission as basically part of the enlargement package uh, annually uh, published by the European Commission. And it seems very ambitious. Um, it's, of course, a very uh, helpful and important initiative. But uh, do you think there will be enough will in the Brussels and also in the European capitals to actually endorse this plan and put it into action? Do you think it's something feasible? It's a good, very good question, of course. Um, um, I think this um, economic investment uh, plan is really, um, in a way, planned to uh, uh, skip um, uh, some true uh, political obstacles uh, uh, we can now perceive between the European Union and uh, its uh, immediate neighborhood. Um, maybe it's uh, even wrong to decrypt, to describe the Western Balkans as an immediate neighborhood because uh, most of the countries in the region are uh, candidates or potential candidates for. Uh, uh, for the membership in the European Union. And uh, let me remind you that this Commission, as an author of uh, this Economic Investment Plan for Western Balkan, uh, explained itself as a geopolitical commission on the very beginning. And uh, we all expect from geopolitical commission to provide uh, feasible solutions uh, to tackle uh, problems in the vicinity of the European Union and the Western Balkan is a it's an absolutely nice example of the region where a European Union is more than needed. So uh, economic investment plan is a, a good design and it's approved. But um, uh, if you ask me, I think that we need a better political infrastructure, political infrastructure uh, within the Western Balkans country to see investment and economic plan fully implemented. Because in this moment, uh, we are coping with so many obstacles of internal kind in all, almost all Western Balkans countries. And uh, there is a lot of bridge to be uh, uh, built before uh, European money and programming, of course, uh, find a fertile soil in, in the Western Balkans. But money is here. And uh, uh, 10 flagship projects, uh, 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 of course, uh, presented by Commissioner Valkyrie uh, months or two before, they're in a way good uh, planning. Now we want to see what might happen, uh, not only with the economic investment plan, but with IPA free generation of, uh, of, the, of the program for the Western Balkans, because it's some kind of the collision. Uh, we got IPA 2 still uh, at the table. We are now negotiating uh, with the Commission and the Council about IPA 3. And uh, a, a lot of money uh, will be in a way uh, uh, overlapping within IPA 3. It's aimed to be used in economic investment plan. So for me, as an enlargement process itself, it's a still a, a question. So. Um, but uh, the, the first uh, question is still unresolved. It's all the pieces of the same package, multi-annual financial framework. It's not, uh, we are not there uh, yet. It's still to be approved uh, by the council. So we are talking about the potentially effect of the investment economic plan, but now ball is not in Western Balkans countries. Ball is still on the European Union ground. So I, guess that uh, uh, investment economic plan is uh, targeting a really deep structured problems in the Western Balkans, infrastructure, whatever, connectivity, um, health uh, uh, systems, uh, which are 
absolutely vulnerable in all six Western Balkans country. We are talking about physical infrastructures, roads. We are talking about the digitalization of the region. Investment Economic Plan talks also uh, uh, about a green uh, deal implemented uh, in the Western Balkans. But we need to be sure that uh, first all this will be approved among uh, uh, European institutions and of course we need to see what really capacities are there in the Western Balkans to accept this chance and to what Mr. Kirk had rightly said uh, to uh, shorten this uh, gap development gap between uh, Western Balkans country and and the European Union because inequality and uh, uh, and uh, divisions of all kind between two areas now it's uh, absolutely uh, uh, huge Thank you, Mr. Pizzola. Uh, Mr. Grek, uh, Slovenian EU presidency is coming uh, quite soon. Actually, in one year after the Portuguese presidency in spring, Slovenia will take over in autumn next year. And I wanted to ask you if the Western Balkans and EU enlargement will be reflected in Slovenian priorities and whether the presidency will have some concrete goals it would like to achieve during uh, its term, the presidency. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before I go into this, uh, let me just uh, continue where uh, Mr. Pizzula ended and also try to answer uh, the question which uh, Ms. Cherneva posed. Uh, I think, and I think this is a fact where everybody agrees, just uh, how we get there, we don't know yet. But the fact is, if we, as the European Union, can't play a decisive role in the Western Balkans, we can't play a decisive role anywhere in the world. Because other geostrategic actors, and we mentioned a few of them, Russia, China, they are quite aware uh, of our, you know, non-activity in the Balkans. And uh, rightly said, where there is vacuum, somebody else will uh, fill it. Uh, so in this sense, yes, we are uh, living in an age of a geostrategic commission, so which have to start acting uh, geostrategically. In terms of uh, Slovenia and uh, the region uh, and our presidency, of course, uh, there was never uh, a doubt that uh, enlargement and uh, the region of Western Balkans are going to be uh, our priorities uh, during the presidency. Uh, it was uh, our priority also uh, during our first presidency of the European Union in 2008. And uh, what we would like to do during the presidency are actually uh, two things, or let's say three. Firstly, we would like to contribute to uh, help uh, continue with the process of solving uh, issues, political and security issues from the past. Uh, we think that, you know, while talking about regional economic cooperation, while talking about uh, cooperation between uh, countries of the Western Balkans, uh, it all comes down to uh, first solving uh, bilateral issues because at the end of the day, they are, uh, you know, the ones who are impeding uh, this cooperation. We can talk all the nice words, we can say, uh, all there is uh, to say in the papers, but uh, at the end of the day, when it comes to concrete actions, we can see that a lot of them stop because some of the issues uh, from the past are still unresolved uh, in the Western Balkans. So I would just name two. One is, uh, of course, the dialogue between uh, Belgrade and Pristina on the normalization of, um, of uh, things and the uh, uh, second one is, uh, of course, the future of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, which uh, we think is uh, quite crucial that the country would kind of, as Mr. Lajcak would say, move from uh, Dayton, Bosnia towards EU Bosnia. Now, what does this mean? Uh, I won't go into that uh, now because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, then. Uh, this is first thing. Then we would like to make some progress, real progress, on the enlargement negotiation path for the countries of the Western Balkans. I think the, the dynamics, which is uh, right now in place, is uh, too slow. 
uh, opening of two negotiations per presidency, you know, this doesn't move us much closer to the goal that we all share, meaning that the Western Balkans becomes, the whole region becomes a member of the European Union. And thirdly, uh, we would like to uh, continue with real and concrete progress on the things uh, which are related to the connectivity agenda, meaning infrastructure, meaning energy, meaning uh, people to people, meaning digitalization. Uh, in this context, especially cybersecurity, we think that cybersecurity uh, is uh, a real important uh, subject uh, also in the relations between the EU and uh, the Western Balkans so that we can improve the resilience of the uh, countries uh, to uh, face this challenge. So uh, these are the you know three things that uh, we would like to kind of focus on. Uh, where we will go, how successful we will be, uh, it's not only uh, up to us, but especially up to political will of uh, the members of the European uh, Union. Uh, and we hope that, you know, answering Ms. Cherneva a question, uh, how to move forward is basically very simple. I mean, very simple and very hard. We need to find political will, ambition and passion to start really dealing and putting, and I think this is the right word, pressure on the uh, leaders of the countries of the Western Balkans to actually uh, continue with the reform processes. Because if we are not active from our side on putting pressure, be it good pressure or bad pressure, uh, then uh, rightly said, uh, I don't think that uh, the things are going to move uh, quickly forward as uh, we all uh, would like to see and uh, would expect. So pressure, pressure. If you want to see transformation of the Western Balkans, then uh, yeah, you have to put more effort into it. You have to send teams, you have to be more thorough, you have to be more uh, precise in looking into the heart of the institutions of the countries of the Western Balkans and just, you know, continue pressuring them to implement uh, what they already agreed. Thank you, Mr. Gerk. Now I would like to actually follow up with two questions to each of you. And uh, these questions are because you were talking about the slow pace of uh, the EU enlargement or accession negotiations and uh, the implementation of the reforms by the candidate countries and so on. And uh, this also has been at the center of the discussion about the revision of the methodology for enlargement. And at the beginning of this year, a new revised methodology was adopted and actually it was also supposed to uh, help uh, basically motivate the countries of the Western Balkans to really implement the reforms they are obliged to reform if they want to enter the EU one day. And I would like to ask you, all of you, uh, whether the enlargement methodology, that the new one which we have in place now, is somehow reflected and uh, is, has somehow helped uh, to take up the pace of the accession process and the accession negotiations of the countries which are already negotiating. And my second question uh, is uh, how to avoid situations like this one with uh, Bulgaria and North Macedonia in the future, how to avoid uh, the possibility that one member state, which is already a member of the European Union, will actually use its position to block uh, or even blackmail uh, the candidate or negotiating country in the process. Uh, so let's start with Mrs. Cherneva, and Mr. Pitsula and then Mr. Grk. Thank you. If you allow me, um, uh, maybe one remark to the previous round. Uh, the, the conversation about catching up and uh, creating inequalities in Europe, because I think this is an important uh, driver for a lot of processes, including um, a very worrying process uh, of brain drain from the region. Uh, and we are all acquainted with the effects of this, uh, not only in terms of demography, but also in terms of lack of re reformist majorities in, in the societies in the region. Um, I would add that funds are not enough. Um, I think uh, if we talk about uh, 
or we, if we talk to people who have left uh, the Balkans, they will tell you that it's also about the rule of law, it's also about pollution, it's also about, you know, the lack of doctors for their children, uh, it's about the level of education and so on. So there is a lot of, um, um, I, I think there is a big problem with uh, uh, governance of uh, spheres which are not part of the key, like healthcare, like uh, uh, education and so on. Um, and and uh, and there is also obviously this rule of law issue, which is very difficult uh, to tackle uh, anyway. And the new methodology is trying to do that um, by basically threatening the, those who backslide with some sort of punishment. Uh, but frankly, I think the new methodology was in a way was a way to get France back on board. Uh, but it was again a reflection of one member state of the you know possibility that one member state would simply put a veto and i think this is uh, uh this is the underlying process on the part of the eu uh that you will have more and more countries uh who cater to their uh, domestic uh, audiences and if you look at eurobarometer you will see that publics also in uh, in uh, places like the Netherlands, Denmark, but also Austria uh, and others are extremely uh, kind of hesitant, uh, not to say negative about enlargement, um, which is to say that it's going to get increasingly difficult to stick to the current framework, I think. Uh, but it also, uh, and I agree with Mr. Gruck that we need to be more focused and use our political resources to put more pressure, um, especially on, in those areas which really affect the everyday life of people of, in the region, um, which I mentioned. Thanks. Thank you, Mrs. Cherneva. Mr. Pizzula, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. I think if you want to answer proper on your questions, uh, and I feel dilemmas, we need to say that enlargement as itself is no longer, unfortunately, a political topic of self-evident importance as it was at the beginning of this century. Uh, but it's for sure that European Union enlargement policy is in fact most effective foreign and security policy instrument. It has till now repeatedly proved itself to be a stabilizing factor for our neighborhood and help uh, spread European Union influence. Um, and the new methodology uh, was introduced, if I remember correctly, just three months after European Council meeting where two Western Balkans, not the Macedonia and Albania, were refused to start negotiations. It was, I think, end of the 2019. Um, and in the meantime, uh, they were given a green light. It shows for me uh, the, that the European Union institutions can react in, a time, in the times of the crisis. And um, uh, regarding uh, new methodology, itself, um, the priority of democracy and the rule of law should be placed at the heart of enlargement process. It was underlined clearly. Um, I think by the opening, the first and closing uh, and the last chapters of justice, corruption and organized crime, and I think uh, respect uh, for the human rights and media freedom. It's a core of the negotiations. Uh, the new methodology should uh, uh, also not be used as a political argument to further delay enlargement. And the new approach uh, introduced uh, some better elements. Uh, above all, it allows negotiation countries to use European Union programs even before accession, what is, I think, uh, a benefit for the citizens. Uh, I think uh, such as uh, uh, 10T transport network uh, or European Green Deal. Uh, basically, uh, the new approach does not differ 
significantly from the existing uh, negotiation framework, uh, which come more and more complex uh, uh, with uh, each new enlargement. And I guess it's also good that uh, already negotiating countries, meaning Serbia, Montenegro, could decide for themselves whether or not to negotiate in accordance uh, with the new methodology. Relating your second question, I think because uh, bad experience from the past uh, um, when member states uh, have blocked uh, newcomers, uh, candidate countries, uh, new methodology also invites that all uh, um, uh, disputes between candidate countries must be resolved well before accession itself. I think it's also a uh, important piece of, uh, of the new methodology. Thank you, Mr. Pizzula. Mr. Grok? Uh, yeah, just a couple of, uh, a couple of points. Um, regarding the new methodology, um, I, th I think also the old one was good, you know. I mean, no methodology is going to help you if you don't understand that enlargement is not a technical process. It is a technical, but uh, mainly it's also political. So if you don't combine political with technical, no new methodology is going to help you. Let me give you another example. European Green Deal and the Western Balkans. It sounds very nice, but if you want to implement the Green Deal in the Western Balkans, uh, you need to be aware that the, you know, level of development of the Western Balkan countries in terms of implementing the Green Deal is much, much more smaller than in the countries of the European Union, which means that they can't implement the Green Deal alone. There needs to be a transition period. And in this transition period, European Union needs to be the one who uh, needs to offer a helping hand to these countries so that the transition would go uh, as smooth as possible. If not, you know, the Green Deal for the Western Balkans is going to stay only on paper. So this is what we are talking about. One is the reality on the ground. Uh, second is, you know, political commitments. And the third one is how uh, do we go about it so that uh, the things that we are talking about are being implemented. Uh, so uh, this is why I was saying, you know, I think the new methodology is better than it was in some areas, as also Mr. Pizzula said, but I don't see that uh, only the new methodology is going to help us overcome uh, this, uh, I wouldn't say stalemate, but this uh, slow incremental approach of uh, the countries of the Western Balkans towards the uh, European Union. We will and we need uh, much more uh, ambition if we want to really make a, make a decisive step. Thank you, Mr. Grok. And now I will move to the questions from the audience, because there are a couple of those. Uh, the first one is, what is your reaction on a thought of Peter Balash, a former EU commissioner from yesterday, on the EU relations with the Western Balkans? Uh, he said that the EU membership is, of course, a very complex issue, but why don't we first focus on the Schengen membership for Western Balkan countries? Can we go maybe in the same order as we went now? So, Mrs. Cherneva first. Um, this is an approach, um, some call it the salami tactics, where you slice up parts of the aki and you take them, you basically take them a bit, you, mm. yeah, you make a shortcut. You take them out of the process and you address them before membership already. Um, and obviously Schengen membership is one of them. I think it's, it's going to be a tough one simply because Schengen is uh, just a very contagious issue within the EU itself. Uh, obviously many countries are talking about the reform of Schengen and so on. Um, and it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be more difficult, but there are other things, um, uh, we're talking about a regional market. We're talking about, um, you know, the, the, the countries in the Balkans are members of the uh, European Energy Union. We're now discussing uh, doing a health union. Why wouldn't the countries in the region become uh, members of a, of a European health union as well? So uh, including 
the countries in processes uh, uh, which are which are now happening, I think is is very important. One of them, for instance, will be would be um, the the dialogue on the future of Europe. This is one uh, also one area where I'm sure the countries in the region would have just uh, something to say. Um, uh, it's about it's about including them. It, it's about be, uh, having them become part of the conversation. Yet it is not uh, going to take away the feeling uh, that um, this ambiguity on enlargement is actually more harmful uh, than useful at the moment. Thank you, Mr. Petsula. I didn't understand clearly. Uh, are you talking about a mini Schengen for the Western Balkans country as a, or as a Schengen itself? I believe the question is on the Schengen itself. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, there is a lot of talk about a mini Schengen uh, for the countries on the Western Balkans uh, uh, between, I guess, Albania, North Macedonia and the Serbia. And it's been a lot of fuss about that. And it's been debated for a while. What does it really mean? Uh, not only mini Schengen, but some other proposals coming uh, from the European Union to the Western Balkans uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way to, uh, how to say, facilitate better connection between two. I think they can be only uh, side projects uh, and maybe we can greet them, welcome them. But first of all, I think in the new methodology, uh, you can read very clearly that the target goal of the negotiation is a full membership of the candidate countries. Uh, so I think we need to underline very clearly uh, that every candidate, possible candidate countries coming from the Western Balkans must first of all uh, become, after negotiations, thoroughly checking, must be part of the European Union. Then, of course, uh, uh, development uh, and uh, course of action uh, will show uh, would or not, whether or not, uh, a particular country can become member of the Eurozone or the Schengen area. So uh, I would like to remind that uh, two years ago or even more then President of Commission Jean-Claude Juncker tabled five scenarios for the future of the European Union and one out of the five is a, a multi-speed Europe. So Basically, we uh, have it right now because out of the 27 countries, some of them are part of the Schengen, some of them are part of the Eurozone, and some of them not. So uh, for me, it's some kind of the natural uh, evolution of the membership of the pe peculiar or particular country of the European Union to uh, progress in accordance with its own capacity to reform itself. So for me, uh, first step for all six uh, Western Balkans countries must be uh, uh, energetic and wholehearted uh, negotiation to become a member of the European Union. Then, of course, it's uh, written in, in, in agreements. Then they, through the time, can, of course, upgrade or uplift their uh, uh, activities within European Union as a member of the Schengen or uh, Eurozone. Thank you, Mr. Pizzola. Mr. Grek? Mm. You asked me at the beginning, I think, the question of credibility, which I didn't answer, so let me um, answer it uh, now. I think the credibility of European Union in the Western Balkans is measured by the success of the enlargement process, by the opening of negotiations, by moving closer on the negotiation ladder towards the European Union. This is what uh, people see, this is what people understand, this is what uh, people expect. So all the rest, you know, they are just tools, mechanisms, in order to bridge this development gap between the Western Balkans and the European Union, so that the countries of the region would be ready when all the conditions and all the criteria are met. But if we are not making any progress on the enlargement steps, on the negotiations path between the countries of uh, the region and European Union, then all the rest is uh, sounding as something that is, you know, diverging from the goal that we set up in so many uh, documents, meaning uh, that uh, these countries would become members of European Union. This is why it's so important if we want to be credible as European Union 
to move forward on the on the enlargement not just by uh, starting with igcs with north macedonia and uh, albania you know this is again a step which needs to be made but then the steps after that needs to be followed up because uh, you know in the past we are always kind of uh, self indulgent indulgent in uh, thinking that you know we make one thing and then we forget about that we look somewhere else there is some other problem and then when we come back we still see that you know uh, time has passed but nothing uh, really happened so uh, this is why i was uh, saying and preaching for a, a long time uh, already that uh, the time in between the time in between is uh, the one which is important the time uh, away from cameras, the time away from uh, public uh, scrutiny. This is a time where uh, real work on the ground needs to be done. Thank you, Mr. Grek. Now I will move to the next question and I will direct this one specifically on Mr. Pizzula because I believe he's the best equipped to uh, react to it. And the question is whether the European Union should allow participation of the Western Balkan countries in the EU vaccine strategy as a way to deepen the EU Western Balkans cooperation. And I would even rephrase the question and ask you whether there is actually such a discussion going on in the Brussels. Yeah, of course, I think <laughs> it's I think uh, in a way um, I think it should. I think it should, because if we're talking about uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, European Union uh, didn't show leadership or uh, efficiency at early stage of pandemic, of course, uh, trying to prevent even uh, export of the medical equipment and, uh, and the drugs uh, elsewhere. Uh, and some countries, member states within European Union even blocked uh, uh, such an export within the European Union. And at that moment, of course, uh, uh, most of us uh, feel a little bit ashamed. And, uh, and even Ursula von der Leyen expressed herself before the members of the European Parliament and say, I'm sorry that we did not react properly uh, in the early days of pandemic on the European Union soil. But then the situation improved and the uh, European Union uh, organized itself uh, pretty soon and in a way backed Western Balkans uh, health system with uh, more than 3 billion euros uh, in, in different ways. So I think if we uh, want to be solidar, if we want to perceive European Union not only as a gathering of 27 states but all the states uh, uh, which would like to join the club so i think that we need to share such an effort and i believe that the final answer will be delivered through the something we didn't even mention in our breakfast it's a conference uh, of the future of the europe it's a proposal coming from commission and should be organized in two years time and it didn't start already. We are hearing some kind of the explanations. But I think a, a conference uh, future of the Europe must in a way give a chance to the Western Balkans countries to be part of it and uh, share some kind of uh, uh, debates and uh, be part of the solution, even in that term uh, uh, and, and process of uh, developing and, and sharing the vaccine. Thank you very much, Mr. Pizzola. Now we are nearing the end of the time slot which was dedicated to this discussion. So I would like to give each of you space to uh, deliver some concluding remarks, address something which hasn't been said and should be said according to your opinion. But please try to stick to uh, very brief statements, 30 seconds ideally. Please, Mrs. Cherneva, let's start with you. I think we basically touched upon on every uh, valid point at this at this point. I think uh, the, the, the enlargement policy is something that the EU will have to decide on in the next uh, maybe two years, whether it wants to really continue with it or not. I don't think that fooling people in the region and fooling ourselves uh, in the long run is going to work. I mean, this type of ambiguity is something that uh, 
uh, that has been working, but it's not, uh, it's not anymore. And frankly, I don't think that there will be many European governments who will want to continue doing that. This is why it's so important now that we get, that we start negotiations, I think, with North Macedonia and Albania, so that we have, uh, we have at least a path that we can continue on uh, for, for some time. And, uh, you know, the overall framework may need really a, a, a bigger overhaul. Thank you, Mrs. Cherneva. Mr. Grok, please. Uh, 15 seconds. Um, we are all here at the European continent on the same boat. The sooner we realize this, uh, the better. Thank you. Thank you for being brief, Mr. Pizzola. Six weeks from now, European Union uh, will lose uh, United Kingdom. United Kingdom will cease to be part of the European Union. So uh, we are living in very odd times because uh, thanks to the Brexit and uh, of course, thanks to the negotiation process, which is along, uh, one can say that European Union, uh, it's not easy to leave, but it's absolutely tough to join. So we need to fix ourselves and we need to talk more about the European perspective of the European Union, not only of European perspective of the Western Balkans countries. Thank you very much, Mr. Pizzola. Now I would like to conclude this discussion. Thank you, you speakers, for joining us today, for sharing your interesting inputs uh, with us and for this fruitful discussion. And I would also like to thank our audience for joining us in this early session in the morning. And I would also like to encourage you to stay tuned in 30 minutes. Uh, there will be the opening musical performance. And at 9.40, we will start with the next part of the Prague European Summit program. Thank you and goodbye.